Welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And this is the Industrial Design Podcast by us. God. <laughs> really? This is Design Pol- Lollapalooza. This is the Willy Wonka, design? <laughs> Willy Wonka of design. No. Graham, we need you to send us some more suggestions. Because we can't, we can't keep it at that. Hey, I, I'm Nick and I'm James. And this is... And we're two industrial designers in New York City making things. <laughs> no. Um, but uh, due to a lot of um, comments, or I would even say complaints... We have reoriented the video. Yeah, we're, we switched sides again. I mean, you guys listening probably can't know that we switched sides. But if you're watching the video, yes, check it out. Look, yeah. at, look at these sketches in the background. <laughs> it turns out that our profiles are rather hideous. <laughs> and uh, But face on... We're trying it out. We're, we're the most attractive industrial design. Well, okay. Reach Legal right. is the most attractive industrial of course, designer. The king. The king. Um, but, uh, but maybe we're second and third or 22nd and 23rd. I don't know. Um, but, uh, yeah. James, you've been gone for a while. I have. You've been in Italy. We haven't had a podcast in like two weeks. I know. How you been? I've been great. Uh, Italy was wonderful. Did you eat lots of pasta? I ate pasta as a main dish in, for every single meal. Breakfast? Every meal. That's awesome. Every meal. Uh, I should say every dinner. It was great. Um, I would say, I would have to say that my favorite part of the trip was um, the very first place that we went to. Where was it? Which was Sorrento, which is on, you know, the coastline. Okay. Um, I guess it's the west coastline uh, of Italy. Um, Really beautiful. The hotel that we stayed in was like this really interesting modern hotel the, our our room was like carved out of this cliffside oh like minecraft exactly like mine <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> do you ever play minecraft james i've never once played minecraft i Have think you? well that's our that's our slight age gap but i played a lot of minecraft really yeah and i would always build my houses on the cliffside interesting mm-hmm. I didn't realize. Wait, so what's our age difference? You're five how old years. Are you? Okay, I'm twenty-five. You're okay. Thirty. Thirty-one. Six years. So that's the age gap for Minecraft. Is are you like the first of the I was Minecraft? The first. Yeah, I was the first. generation. Mm-hmm. What was? Can you explain to me the appeal? The original Minecraft. Yes, I, it's a mix between like going camping and Legos, mm. but in a video game. That yeah. was that's like when I first played it it didn't have a lot of like things going on all you could do is really just knock down trees and dig but you could build these little shelters and the so the monsters wouldn't get you and yeah because the zombies come out at night right the the zombies come out at night can Um, you fight the zombies yeah you could build a little sword to fight the zombies you could build a sword yeah but (laughs) it sounds like it sounds like a maker's fantasy (laughs) yeah it's definitely a designer's game for sure that's interesting. Now, were you only exploring your own worlds, or were you exploring other people's worlds? It was solo. I just played it solo for for a while, um, and then I guess mm. they implemented some sort of online thing, right? And I I could play with my friends then. <clears throat> um, and well, now and now they have it like you can play online on your phone. I like you can see like kids on the subway like playing Minecraft online on their phone. How do they even yeah. do it? I don't know. I don't know, but I'm glad to hear you made some friends, Nick. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then. Uh, I, so we went to uh, Sorrento, then to Florence, which was really amazing, and then to Rome, obviously. Right. Um, saw all the sites. The Leaning Tower of Pisa. The weird, the really weird thing, and I've started to notice this now that I'm back in New York, and I don't know if it's, um, if it's people who are visiting New York. I, th- w- my wife and I counted thirty-five Levi's T-shirts. White t-shirts with a big Levi's logo. Okay. 35. Okay. Like, this was a trend. We were we were just going through Italy. Like, it was just like the white Levi's in a red box? The the white t-shirt. This red said, Levi. You know, Levi's translates to Supreme in Italian, right? <laughs> it's a lot sharper, though. Watch out. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, I don't know. It, I'm... 
I wish somebody, if somebody understands the trend, please let me know, was like Kylie Jenner wearing a Levi's t-shirt or something. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's it's everywhere. Hmm, interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, but anyway, after counting all of the Levi's t-shirts, I came back to New York City <laughs> and lo and behold, Nick Baker stole my job. Well, <laughs> I, I tend to steal James's jobs and he's very gracious and gives them to me, but... I mean, I, I work on a big exaggerating. Now, what I do, Nick, <laughs> and this is for your benefit, is I go and I scout out new jobs. James and starts then, them. And then I bring you in. Right, and I finish them off. Yeah. And then they're like, wow, this kid's a lot more talented than this first guy we brought <laughs> no, in. Oh, that's not what happens. <laughs> but uh, but no, I mean, this is this is just what happens when you're in the design field. Like, if you go away for a week, or in my case with... Italy. Well, I'd been away for a week. Yeah, you were gone um, like two weeks. Two weeks prior, and then a week and a half in Italy. And during that time, decisions get made. Yeah. And and Gotta things move forward. Mm -hmm. And by the time I got back, there was no reason that they needed two designers on staff. And you kind of had it all under control, so there's no reason for me to be there. I'm sorry, James. <laughs> no, no. I actually think that this is like one of the best parts about freelancing is like you know it, i'm not in pain by not having a job yeah, you, i'll just go you know and, like going ha having to go to work and just sit there and not do anything yeah, yeah. that that that's the worst. i think is is like that's worse than being too busy that's you know? the definition of purgatory is getting paid to sit mm -hmm. at a desk yeah and and not have any sort of task for sure like i have been in that position where i'm full-time salary worker and i'm sitting around for an entire day oh, and it's like because that's, that's uh, nerve-wracking it is because you're because you're kind of like should i look busy there, i'm trying to yeah, look busy like like everybody you feel like everybody's looking at your computer <laughs> it's like it is the worst position to be in i yeah. would rather be like up to my gills with tasks for sure for then sure have nothing to do and being paid to do it i totally agree it's the worst yeah um, i i i uh i am excited though because the product we did work on i think is well in in general it's an amazing product yeah and i think the design is solid and i'm excited to see where it'll go you know i'm yeah. just i'm just kind of finishing wrapping it up but it, yeah we, we both had some good good design work put into it yeah i mean i had to you know, it was a case where, like, coming into it, I was the really the only industrial designer and had to lay a lot of the groundwork, which yeah. is, it's no it's no small task when a company does not have a visual brand language yeah. to come in and try and sift through everybody's opinions about the product and, like, try to develop that persona for the company. For sure. And it's for like, sure. you know, so... But then Nick, when you came in, you brought you brought with you a new set of eyes, which was really important at that point mm -hmm. of the process, and brought a lot of clarity to like what I had been trying to accomplish, I guess, or, or yeah. like the the groundwork that I, we, was I think putting we had down. we had a good yin and yang. You know, you had yeah. the you were kind of up there in the sky, and then I brought you down, and then you pulled yeah. me, you pulled me back up, and we kind of went back and forth with it. Yeah. Really came out with a solid thing. Well, yeah. I think we should. Have, we'll have a full episode. We will it. have a full episode once everything is released out in the open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, sorry about sorry about uh, stealing your job, James. But I appreciate no it. No worries. <laughs> and uh, it looks like you're also making money online uh, through Patreon. <laughs> I did. <laughs> yeah, my I've been busy too. Like these past two yeah. weeks, I uh, launched my Patreon, and you know we've talked about it in the past, but it's essentially like. Like a Netflix or a Kickstarter for creatives. Yeah. Um, I'm doing all my chair sketches now. I'm videotaping them. I'm getting better. I think last time we talked, I had messed up my videotaping session, and it took like five hours to videotape oh. a chair <laughs> chair sketch. That's... I'm getting better. Yeah. Um, and it's great. I've had, I think, nine patrons now, or Patreon supporters. Do you call them patrons or patrons? Patrons. Patrons. Yeah. Um, and it's going good. I... I feel like it's a good starting point. Yeah. I'm excited to see where it goes. And if you guys want to check it out, feel free. Uh, Patreon.com backslash Nicholas Baker. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, starting, start kind of starting all these things. I mean, you've got the Patreon. We've got the podcast. 
and uh, there might be other things that I'm leaving out, like you know, you've got almost object, and you know, all of these, all of these kind of it, it's very entities. Yeah, it's all these entities. It's kind of low stakes in a way, but it's very I don't know it the it's it's very fun yeah. to like start from zero. I think I think too to that point. I was thinking about I think about this a lot. You know, right now, since I've started a few of these new newer endeavors, I feel like I'm maybe stretched pretty far, maybe too thin. I don't know, um, but it's it's a it's time for us to experiment. You know, we're still right. young. We can take a year or two just to like try out different things, see what we right. like. You know, when we're forty, then that's where we can like sit down and be like, okay, I've tried out all these things, and it's time to like really focus on this one thing. You know, I really love building a design brand or like i really love having a studio and then at that point that's when you can be like all right i'm gonna become the next Dieter rams or something right right but i i think a lot of i mean at least with the for me with the podcast it kind of combines a lot of different interests of mine into (laughs) one package whereas i wouldn't necessarily because you like film you like just conversating about design yeah it's like I wouldn't, uh, you know, I wouldn't necessarily be a filmmaker in the purest sense. Right, right. But being able to film and edit the podcast, mm-hmm. and then also I did radio back in my school days, and I know you did a podcast back in your school days, being able to do this, but all of that centered around design, which is kind of like the main focus. It's perfect. It is, it is kind of perfect, and it's kind of a lesson for people out there who have multiple interests See where like, you can combine them. Yeah, you know, it's it's always fun to see how you can kind of throw those interests into your work. For sure, for sure. Um, but, you know, another thing that happened over this past week were the awesome renderings oh, yes. of your chairs. Yes, yeah. So you, if you Render it, Weekly. Oh, man. Yeah, you know, I, t- I teamed up with Render Weekly. You did the Render Weekly team up, what, a month or two ago mm-hmm. with your helicopters. I did mine with my chair sketches. Yeah. And some of those chairs were just amazing. So basically what the difference, the major difference between yours and mine was I provided them with 3D. I gave them the 3D of my helicopters and people rendered them. Right. With yours, people actually had to interpret your chair sketches, Mm -hmm. model them, and then render them. Yeah. Which was even... That there were there was another layer of More interest steps. there, yeah. You know where it's like how how does this how well are people going to be able to interpret the chairs through the sketches? And there are some spectacular interpretations. Yeah, I I just wanted to take a few moments to shout out a few people. I there was this one guy who did my rope chair. I think I think the rope chair is my favorite. It's it's a simple chair, but. You know, I had this idea of, like, just tying the cushions on with, like, sailor rope. Yeah. And he really, or they really just made it in my vision. Like, I couldn't ask for anything that was clear vision than what uh, at M N dot visual did. Yeah. Um, there were so many people that did awesome stuff. I mean, there's this great guy, uh, or they their name is Mag noose scopes for <laughs> jordan we'll link him on the website um, hooked on phonics worked for nick <laughs> did my uh apollo lunar lander chair yeah well, some people did the um the plant chair like oh the, the uh, plant chairs renderings were really impressive right there were a bunch um and yeah i mean there was you know a lot of people there's actually one guy who's done my chairs in the past poya studio he does awesome work too, but definitely check out Render Weekly, um, the hashtag, as well as Nick's Chair Sketches hashtag, and you can see a lot of the renderings. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, thanks for everyone who submitted the renderings. I loved them all. Um, I don't know, just put a smile on my face. I understand how excited you were now when you were. <laughs> I remember like we were sitting working together, and you'd be like, "Oh, check out this new render of the helicopter." I'm like, "Yeah, that's that's cool." Yeah, and Nick would roll his eyes i mean because every it would be every five seconds and i'd be like oh yeah okay james i've seen it but no i i get it now it's like they're put it they're bringing your ideas to life essentially you know yeah yeah it's a really interesting way of collaboration because it's you're not you're not like art directing these renderers right they're just creating what they envision you know yeah and it's uh 
it's so cool to see what people can do with with the content that's already kind of been created mm -hmm. to create their own little world within that. Uh, it's, yeah. yeah, it's really amazing. Thank you, thank you, Render Weekly, and everyone who helped out. Yeah, um, I, I have another quick, oh quick my God, quick come on, Nick, updates. really? I don't, I don't mean to hog the week. I have updates. another update. <laughs> <laughs> I had a Lacroix today. Back to you, Nick. Um, uh, I'm really excited, and I really want to uh, announce that, or I'm happy to announce that I'm going to be talking at Apple. Mm. Um, here at the headquarters. No, I wish. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the Apple Williamsburg store mm -hmm. in New York City. Yeah. Uh, Tuesday, September eighteenth, at six thirty p.m. And uh, I'll put the link in my bio of my of my Instagram as well as on myrndetailspodcast dot com. But I'm super excited because you know how Apple does these talks where you know they'll bring in artists and designers to talk about their work and then do like a live sketching demo. Yeah. Um. So I just wanted to announce that I I really want everyone who's in New York to come. And for them to bring all of their friends, yeah, um, I want it to be a big, a big uh, gathering. So, yeah, that'd be awesome. I'm definitely going to be there. Cool. Um, I'll be doing a live podcast <laughs> while you're doing your demonstration. In competition? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'll be just be commenting oh, on what oh, you're doing. Live commentary. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. That'd be yeah. good. Um, for anybody who can't be there, obviously. You know? Yeah, people are asking me if I should live stream it, and I don't know. Maybe we'll figure that out. Yeah. I think it'd be cool to live stream it or record it in, in some manner. Right. Yeah, that would be dope. I'm excited because they have the huge, they have the huge, like, big screen in the back of the Williamsburg store. Huge, big, ginormous <laughs> screen. Have we, uh, actually, coincidentally, today is Apple Day. Oh, and they released a big, giant, enormous new iPhone. With a notch. James, well, James hates the notch. Here's what I have to say about the what is it the XM or what it's like <laughs> XSM. There's the yeah there, there's the iPhone X Max. Yeah. Is it XS? There's oh, the shoot. it's I the I, it's the iPhone S and M. Uh, no, the uh, it's now there's now a bigger help, help Hector help us. <laughs> there's a bigger iPhone now. Yes. The biggest that I, they've ever iPhone produced. X S Max. I think that we should be thankful that the 90s are coming back in fashion because that means cargo <laughs> pants are back, which is the only way you're going to be able to pocket this phone. Um, also, Apple is offering to redesign your hands uh, to be able to hold this one comfortably. It's Finger extensions? It's, you know, I, I kind of, I made a joke on my Instagram about watching the keynote because I did an Ask Me Anything and somebody was asking if I was going to watch it. And I said, you mean watch an event where they basically release bigger versions of the <laughs> things that they've already done. And, bigger but thinner. <laughs> and the other thing that really, okay, the other thing that really bugged me, and I know that it's very common for me to, to rail on Apple, but here, here I go again. I'm the mediator. The, the graphic that they put on the phone... It's, it's kind of this like half planet yeah. on the side. Mm -hmm. And it was the graphic that was used to when they first show right. the phone. Like they've done like the earth in the past and like yeah. a lotus flower. But the, this one was like a half a planet. The or... way they crop it out, it eliminates the notch. Yeah, they, they the black part fills up the notch area so you don't see it. And it's like... It's sneaky. It's sneaky. Come on, guys. I'll, I'll agree. But I also think like there is a point to that. Like you don't want to show off the flaws of your device and listen listen the notch it's a it's it's a growing pain right i johnny's not advocating for the notch he obviously doesn't want it there right he's pushing the company to a notchless place it just takes time it's like a teenager i don't know you're to, you had acne when you were a teenager right <laughs> to me it's like you had if, your flaws james i don't know yeah to me it's like if you shaved your head and found out you had a huge dent in it or, <laughs> i i don't know it's uh so you would agree? I I understand your point. It's like you should have, we should have not done the full screen unless we couldn't. Yeah, I mean, the new Apple Watch, on the other hand, mm. is edge to edge, and that makes a lot of sense. I don't know where's the iPad with edge to edge. Oh, I think uh, that's the next event. They were just doing Apple Watch and phone this this time, but the the iPad's coming. I also will say I really enjoyed the new watch design. 
Yeah. Uh, with the bigger radiuses on yeah. it. Yeah. Re- I, I really think nice. It's, I think it's nice. But but right now Apple just feels like it it just feels like a finessing exercise. Yeah, it's that, well, and 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 I understand that they like revolutionized a lot of industries with what they've done, but there's no like I, I'm not really that excited anymore. I, I do agree. I think there is that I feel like we've plateaued a bit with yeah. technology in general. Yeah. Um, especially just normal consumer products. It's hard to really wow anyone now with a new phone or a new laptop or what it whatever it is. Yeah. Um I still think Apple's making amazing quality work. Of course. Um, They're and, always going to make amazing hardware and and at the top of the line. Yeah. Um, um but you know, it's start it's starting to the the playing field is getting more level for sure. Yeah. Fastco, who <laughs> might hate Apple more than I do, <laughs> even though obviously I have a love hate relationship with Apple. We both um, well, I, I love Apple. Yeah, but um, they named in their um, design awards. Uh, what's the name of their design awards? But they named Google the design company of the year. Yeah, I don't agree with that, but that's you don't company. you don't think the hardware is. I mean, to me, it's the most interesting electronics that have been what? produced. Google Home? Like, yeah, that whole system. You don't like Google Home? I like, I like Google Max. Google Home, I think, is really ugly with the, like, cut, the arbitrary, like, slash on the top. Like, you're you, talking, like you're you talking about... a piece of bamboo and it's like, I don't know. You're talking about the, like, the one Google Home item. I'm talking about, like, the Google Home Mini. I like the and, Mini and I and, like the Max. Yeah. Um, like, I, just I don't think like the, the whole suite. Well, the the normal Google Home Oh, I don't... Suite. I don't or have they phased that out. The Google Home doesn't doesn't bother me. Well, what do you like then? Uh, what do you mean? I mean, what do I like about Yeah, what, what that? do you like about Google as a design company? I just think that they're well, I don't know that they're necessarily doing anything original because like we've seen companies like is it Vifa and Bang and Olufsen upholstering like electronics. Oh, the but soft I, soft applications. But I yeah. think, you know, a large part of what they're doing is um, you know, uh, making electronics contextual within the home like not you know it's it's uh you know not having the big glossy mm-hmm. black thing in your home that just screams tech yeah um it's more contextual it's more friendly um i just think it for a big company uh what they did was um you know probably more risky than what apple has been doing with their devices, which is essentially just re-releasing the same devices with, you know, updates to the engineering and, you know, minor tweaks. Right. Um, I think, yeah, what they did was a risk, and I think that it paid off. I mean, obviously, Apple is still outselling them. Yeah. But I would just like to see a competitor to Apple that forces Apple to do something more interesting i think yes i think maybe google was one of the first to implement the soft materials into the tech world um i I, at a mass consumer scale right 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 and i i think that maybe google's strong suit is their ui ux i think they're that that ecosystem of google docs gmail and all that the drive i think that is very um it's amazing i think their ecosystem is much better than apple's so i will applaud them for that yeah in terms of their hardware i don't know they're i might disagree in, with you they're in their infancy though for sure okay yeah you know and i agree I, on that part and like i said i just i want there to be a strong competitor to apple i don't think it'll ever be samsung no <laughs> Um, I don't know. Maybe that's just my own prejudice yeah. against Samsung, but I I think that Google stands the biggest chance to to like be a pushback against what Apple has been doing. Yeah, and push them into doing something new. Yeah, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting yeah. to see how the future of tech evolves and yeah. whether or not Apple will be dethroned eventually. It's a question. I mean, eventually, will it even be a company? Well, I mean, we're all going to (laughs) die. The world will end someday. Yeah, who's going to die first? 
Uh, I, I hope we, I, I hope I bury <laughs> Apple. <laughs> oh man! No, I'm kidding. That's horrible, James. That is terrible. Uh, but um, you know, when we're talking about from from one portfolio of product, you know, Apple's just released their latest portfolio of product. I don't think that their presentation was very compelling. So let's talk about portfolios, Nick. Yes. What makes a compelling portfolio. I get emails about this now personally. Yeah, we all the time about reviewing portfolios. Yeah, I, I do definitely get those portfolio emails too. Um, and yeah, I mean, we want to talk this week about how, I guess, our opinions and our strategies and tips in a, on how to make a great portfolio. Um, yeah, I think I think it's important. And I think the game has changed quite a bit, especially with the internet. Do you have, like, how did you present your portfolio when you first started out, James? Oh, gosh. Here's here's the thing that I'm going to say right off the bat. I do not think that I had a good portfolio. Like, I out, think of, that out of school? Out of school. I don't, I think I had good work. I don't think I had a good portfolio. Did you, ha- when did you start your portfolio? That's a question. Uh, third year. Okay. Which, you know, Virginia Tech had, we graduated after our fourth year right. of industrial design. Right. So some programs go to a fifth year. Okay. So uh, just to clarify, I started in my junior year. Hmm. I, I started my portfolio, I want to say freshman year. Like in foundation studio? I, so I've always been a website guy. I like having a website... I like being able to like send a, uh, you know, a domain. Did you have a website in high school? No, I think when I started my portfolios, when I had a, had the website. Oh, I was hoping you had some sort of enthusiast, <laughs> like I, I don't know what Minecraft enthusiast website, <laughs> Minecraft in, uh, blog or something. In high, yeah, in high school. Um, no, but maybe I did. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I started my portfolio on Tumblr. I here's mm. I I think we should get into some of these nitty gritty details because these are the sure. people these are what people want. Um, so Tumblr um, is a free platform for hosting your domain that doesn't add any ads or any badges or anything. So you minordetailspodcast.com dot com is hosted on Tumblr and it's free. Mm. I mean you have to pay the domain, which is like thirteen dollars a year. Right. Um, but most hosting sites charge like twenty bucks a month, like Squarespace does. Hmm. Um, so that's a quick tip for you guys. If you are, you know, short in cash, and you want a website, try out a Tumblr. There's a few different uh, portfolio like themes you can add to your Tumblr to make it look like a professional website. And so that's what I did for most of my college career. Was I had a Tumblr website? Wow. Is Nick Baker Design is that uh, your your main page? Is that still a Tumblr? N- Nick is- Baker Design dot com, I believe, was actually my or maybe it was in Baker. I think it might have been in Baker design. Um, but it was, yeah, it was my first website and it looked really similar to the one I have now. It had just the cubes, the tiles. Yeah. Tiles. They're not cubes. I guess they're flat, but (laughs) I don't know my shapes. Um, yeah, it was pretty simple, really the same format I had like three by three. And I've really kept that format ever since. And I think it's a great format because it's simple. It's clean. It communicates what's on my page and what my portfolio is and there's a lot of websites out there that do a lot of different things um i think the the key with websites is to figure out what is easiest and just shows off your work the best Mm -hmm. because we're not trying to kill ourselves we're not we're not web designers over here no you know you don't have to create the amazing ux ui website and if you have the cash go like squarespace or wix or whatever because that's way easier than a tumblr right yeah, I mean, I think that would be that would be kind of my number one piece of advice is don't don't try to be too flashy with your portfolio. Mm-hmm. Like in terms of graphics. Like we are not graphic designers. Right. And we've said this over yeah. and over again, but it's definitely something to reiterate it. Like you don't need to put in especially in your resume. Mm. You know how people have the little bars that on the resume that's like, 
I know Photoshop, three out of five stars. No, don't say that. <laughs> that means you know Photoshop kind of okay. Yeah. Just put like your, uh, uh, um, what do you what do you call it? Like, just put your skill set. Yeah. Photoshop. I mean, people, people understandably are obsessed with infographics because they are incredible. But there's an incredible amount of work that goes into making good infographics. Yeah. And I don't think they belong in resumes, in mm-hmm. my opinion. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've reviewed some portfolios recently that I felt it was just way too much, um, way too many graphics, uh, too much text, too mm. much, like, I, I would like to point everybody to a video that was done recently okay. by Sam Does Design, okay. where he reviewed his portfolio, like, like from from graduation, his graduation portfolio that got him his first job. Okay, how how many how many years has he been has, been, has he been working now? Oh, I'm not sure. Okay. I can't I can't speak to but, that. But with he's any looking. Accuracy. He's looking back. He's and, looking at back his at his portfolio, okay. and um, you know, I thought it was a really interesting exercise because in the beginning of the video he shows kind of how long. An employer actually spends looking at your portfolio literally like 10 seconds yeah probably right and yeah and and i mean like i think we all kind of knew this or at least i remember knowing this in college that people rarely look at text bodies like oh they, for sure they're they're not reading your text yeah i don't even know how to read let alone no. read a portfolio. So. Yeah. No, it's amazing. I was in bed one night trying to fall asleep, and I asked Nick to read me a bedtime story. I said, sorry, James. And, yeah, couldn't eat, not even redfish, bluefish. You should have seen his tear, <laughs> tear down his yeah. cheek. Nick blew out the candle and walked out of the room. Um, but, um, yeah, I think um, you have to keep that in mind. You have to keep in mind that, like, you... When when people are reviewing portfolios, they're often reviewing a stack of portfolios. For sure. And, and they're just they're flipping through, scrolling, whatever it is. Yeah. And so the more visually impactful that you can be with your work and your process, mm-hmm. that is key. I, I totally agree. And one tr- thing that I do in my website to kind of wrap up that idea is I only have, first of all, I only have like maybe nine images max. Right. Sometimes six. Um, you know, I'll have kind of this teaser image that's on the thumbnail. Maybe it's on top of the kind of the beginning of the project. And then when you scroll down, you'll see a sketch or not a sketch. It's more like a graphic, like a graphical sketch. Yeah. I think of it as a cartoon. I know uh, the big uh, design studio, Nendo, does cartoons where they'll make these little characters and they'll draw out the concept of, you know, maybe it's some new chair they designed. Um, and I took that idea and implemented it into my portfolio so that when you scroll down, you see that cartoon and instantly you understand the project. Right. You see, you know, for my birdhouse, it was like sad bird trying to find a place to land on a utility pole and it couldn't. And then there was a happy bird in the tree. And you get it. You get the project right away. You get that I'm doing a birdhouse for a utility pole. Right. And then you scroll down. You see sketches. You see maybe one or two images of, you know, maybe me 3D modeling or me printing it out. And then you see the final image. Yeah. Maybe a final image or two. Video is becoming more popular. I mean, if you do videos, definitely include them in your website. Yeah. Have have you thought about doing maybe, maybe... I kind of want to talk about different formats of portfolios. Mm. I mean, because a lot of people do PDF portfolios, Mm -hmm. um, printed portfolios, web portfolios. Some people even have, like, turned their Instagram into a portfolio. Right. There's Behance. There's Coraflat. I mean, what are your opinions on that? Oh. Like, formats. Well, I I took on, uh, I guess, Reed Schlegel's uh, sort of mindset, which is I don't... I don't have a portfolio website. Right. I just have a Behance. I never, I, I still need to ask him about his manifesto because yeah. I never heard it. I, I've and heard I, he's I, talked about it many times why yeah. he doesn't have a website, but I want to hear it from him. I think it's, I think it's all you need really for your, per, for your professional portfolio. Like all you need is a Behance and love according to the Beatles. <laughs> but, I, I <clears throat> okay. I kind of see what you're saying. I agree. I think if you want 
to get a design job like full time in the field, you know, working for whatever it is, Frog Smart, maybe it's in house set a brand. Yeah, all you need is a Behance just to show it a future employer. Yeah. I think on contrary to that, if you want to do other endeavors, whether that's uh, consulting or, um, you know, building some sort of whatever it is, like podcast or design brand, I think that's when you branch out into a website. Mm. That's that's my opinion. I mean, that's kind of what I've done. Well, I mean, is that just so you can point those people to a website and they'll feel like that's more official? I think it's kind of, for me, it's almost like a home base. Mm-hmm. My website is my home base. I have my work on there. I also have all my links to Almost Object as well as minor details. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's something that I can build off of and really customize. Yeah. Uh, I think if you're in school, you really don't need to think this far ahead. I yeah. think if you want to have the Tumblr.com or whatever it is and have the cheap website, um, that's great. But I think your number one focus should be the project itself. And, right. And Behance or Coreflot does a great way of doing that. I personally like Behance better. Yeah. Uh, well, one thing that I've noticed a lot of people doing on Behance is putting basically the PDF oh, of their portfolio. Please, please don't. <laughs> this is a hot topic for me. Oh, gosh. And and so it's their entire year's portfolio. You know, their new their new portfolio. It'll be labeled like the year that it that it was made. And it'll be the entire portfolio in one Behance project. Okay, let me just get in my soapbox right quick. I uh... here, let me find it for you. <laughs> it's right over here. Here you go. Okay, I am a strong believer, very strong, that the medium in which you post something needs to be considered. Right. Right. You, if you're posting on Behance, you need to understand how Behance works as a medium. It's like YouTube. It's like Facebook. It's like Instagram. Like, you're not going to get on Facebook and post an hour-long video. No, you're going to put that on YouTube. You're not going to get on Instagram and post a resume. No, you're going to, like, print it out and take it to your employer. You're not going to get on Behance and upload your PDF portfolio. No. Yeah. You need to take the images off of your PDF portfolio. Just have the JPEG, right? Like, no graphics, right? We're not using graphics. We're not a graphic designer. And put those JPEGs into the Behance project. Yeah. And put the text into the Behance project, but don't upload that PDF page to your Behance. Because one thing is different is Behance profiles, and uh, not profiles, Behance projects are, like, vertical. You scroll through them. Yeah. And when you put that long landscape horizontal PDF into that Behance project, the images become so small, especially if you've placed a bunch of them on one page, that you can't read them. Right. So every time someone sends me their PDF that is on a Behance page or something like that, I just say, no, post post a normal Behance project, and I'll review your portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just had to get that out because it just aggravates me so much. No, it's, it's, it's worth knowing yeah. because I... I don't think that people understand that, that that it's a different medium, mm-hmm. which means that you have to relay a different message. I, I almost I almost think there's a flaw in it. I almost kind of want to blame the college. Mm-hmm. I think that in portfolio class, you learn that, hey, you make a physical portfolio, like you print yeah. out pages and you take it to your interview and you present to your future employer. And... And in some circumstances, that's what's hap- that's what happens after school. Um, I think like you and I are at the stage now where maybe, you know, we don't necessarily bring in a physical portfolio to an interview or to a potential client. Um, it's more of kind of word of mouth or checking out our website. Right. Um, but right out of school, like it's still, it's still something good to have. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where people get mixed up because they build this big book of of work and they have all these projects that they've arranged on these pages and they don't want to do the extra work to put it on a behance so they just take the pages of the pdf yeah yeah here's here's another thing that i will say about the pdf portfolio uh the printed portfolio when i was in college i i kind of came to this um conclusion that there was no reason that I shouldn't be making 
eight and a half by 11 sized portfolios. People were experimenting with all sorts of sizes and styles. And the other thing that we were doing a lot of was full bleed mm -hmm. imagery. Yeah. I completely eliminated that. By, oh, the, really? by the end of college, I was like, this portfolio should be so like good and tight that the employer can print it out at their office and no quality should be lost. That's interesting. You know, I think that we hmm. try to do these flashy things and they're completely unnecessary. And it's like, use the page size that that is standard, like work within these confines. That's that's interesting. And I optimize for that. I think that that is a intriguing idea. I also not exactly sure. You're on not the, sold on it. I'm not exactly sure on the thought process of the employer printing out the portfolio. It happens. It it does. I think in some circumstances and maybe some corporate atmosphere, it might happen. Um, I think nowadays, maybe we're more online focused. I mean, I, I strongly believe that like if someone asked me for a PDF portfolio and I said, oh, I have a website and they said, oh, I'm sorry, we only accept PDF portfolios. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't want to work right. for you because you're living in 1995. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me call up Johannes Gutenberg. Let me, maybe he can print it out. Or, or, you know, IBM. I'm sure they have some sort of dot matrix machine they, they can... Uh, <laughs> um, but um, I, I also want to say, if you are, if, if for whatever reason, if you want to make a printed portfolio... Uh, my portfolio, printed portfolio, I'm actually pretty proud of it. It was uh, pretty clean, pretty simple. I took, maybe, can I, it's right there. Can I grab it real quick, James? Oh, I should show God. You right, but Nick, go. while, you're, while you're going over there and doing that, uh -huh. one thing that I just thought of was, what about, what about the 3D printed portfolio? Or, 3D or printed. the VR portfolio. Okay. Ooh, VR portfolio, that would be groundbreaking. I'm actually going to do that right now after we end this podcast. <laughs> All right, I have my portfolio up. If you're watching the video, you can see it kind of. Um, but here I am. Uh, the number one he's thing He's very I, proud of this portfolio. This is not the first time he's brought this out during major details. The number one... I, I, I have, haven't I? Yeah. The number one thing I want to uh, show is that I'm using both pages of the spread. Right. A portfolio is a book. When you open it up, there's going to be two pages on, on one side and the other. And when you're in InDesign, probably making your portfolio, you're thinking about each page as a separate thing. But no, look, my sketches go across one whole page. And I just put sketches on two separate pages. Um, it, essentially, what I'm getting at is like use very little uh, thing. Like this is just one image across two pages. Two pages. Okay, we can probably. That's stop. a teaser. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll we'll post some more on our, our website and stuff. I think um, I think really the core of this is keep it simple. Yes. Keep it keep it image based because the rate at which people are flipping through portfolios is Very so quick. fast that they are looking for impactful imagery. Yes. And then also match the message to the medium. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's an if it's a Behance, think about the scrolling right. versus uh, a printed portfolio. You're talking about spreads. Also, I will say, sorry, I, I'm just really, I'm really excited about He's this. He's very excited. I'm just really getting into this podcast <laughs> right now. Okay. Uh, Behance is also a social media website to some extent. You know, the way Behance works is that you can like and appreciate different projects and people use it as like a pseudo Pinterest kind of way. Um, so also think about that. Like yeah. If it scroll through p other people's projects, see how they present. Right. There's Absolutely. some, there's some amazing work on Behance. And when it comes to Instagram, I am not necessarily all for putting like full projects, portfolio projects on Instagram. I did recently post about a specific detail of one of my projects on Instagram, kind of as an experiment. Oh, the peeler. The peeler. The peeler. Because I wanted to talk about one specific detail of right. it that and how it was developed. And I think Instagram is a great place for showing more of your personality because personality matters mm -hmm. when it comes to getting a job. For sure. Um, and it's a great place to experiment and to and to kind of like 
connect yeah connect with others yeah so um i wouldn't treat i would never treat instagram as like a, a grounds to put portfolio work and to try and to explain a portfolio process i would agree i think instagram's meant for the story yeah. um i think everyone has a different take i know i i know our friend reed has the take on instagram where it's like he would not never put anything that he wasn't fully confident in on their his instagram i mean yeah. he, he's at the point where like everything's great but uh you know i i know like a lot of young younger designers use instagram as a place for you know putting up their work and getting feedback I think that's fine. Not everyone agrees, but I think, you know, Instagram is a place for community. I I think that there should there should always be a place because Behance feels like the polished place. It's like the the solidified area of this is a project. And I think that on Instagram, I I don't want people to fear the backlash of posting something that's not fully baked. You know, because you could very well post something that you're kind of so-so about and find out that there's something in there that resonates with people that you didn't even realize. Yeah. I think it's a grounds for experimentation. For tr- true, true. I agree. So um, with that, I think we should move on to questions. Yeah, you, you asked for some portfolio-specific questions, so this mm-hmm. is awesome. We, yeah. have, we have some questions coming in, and we really appreciate I know a lot of people sent us questions, and we've had a lot of stockpile over the past two weeks. Um, so thank you for sending that in. If you have a question yourself, feel free to email minor details podcast at gmail.com. Um, our first question comes from Jose and his Instagram is at no face dot nobody. And Jose says, I like fashion, photography, 3d scenography. I don't even know what scenography is. He's pioneering, <laughs> um, scenography. My question is, is if it, if this helps my career as a product designer, how can I include these works in my portfolio? Slash, should I? Essentially, Jose has these other passions, maybe not specifically industrial design, um, and he's wondering if he should put them in his design portfolio. I, okay. I think that if it doesn't incorporate itself, I think you can always find a way to incorporate these passions into your work. You know, uh, scenography i mean uh, i'm not quite sure what that is but i think it has to do with scenes i I check developing scenes i think i would agree i mean from context clues maybe yeah and and i mean setting up renderings is it's an art form it is an art form and that's some sort of scenography Mm -hmm. i think fashion if you're really interested in fashion then pursue soft good products yes you know pursue do do a backpack or something find Find the Venn diagram between your interests and your work. Mm, it's beautiful, James. And uh, and that that could be your portfolio. On the other hand, if you want to put supplemental sort of creative work, put it at the end of your portfolio. You know, I don't think that you should try to weave it in to your product portfolio because a lot of times that can be kind of messy. Yeah, I like. I, I it, I know, agree. You know yeah. what I mean? I, I agree for sure. I actually, I'm trying to think back on my experience. So I did a good bit of graphic design when I was starting out, like I've mentioned previously. And I do remember in my portfolio, maybe sophomore or junior year. Oh, that's one thing I wanted to say. I started my portfolio, oh, did I say that? Freshman year? Yeah. Um, but keep, you know, start your portfolio early and then just keep reiterating it. Right. And the key thing to note here is that your portfolio is never finished and it's never going to be finished. Nope. Um, so start it early and just keep uh, refining it. But I had graphic design in the end of my portfolio, like you said, James. Nowadays, it would only be design. I also know some people who have a design portfolio and their other portfolio. Hmm. I know a, a few UX, UI designers who maybe are doing UX because that's where the jobs are, but they want to be doing industrial design. Right. So they have both portfolios. Yeah, that's an interesting thing because do you think that there's a good reason for an industrial designer who's interested in working in industrial design to put a UX, UI project in their portfolio? When I graduated from SCAD, 
I had just taken a UX UI class. Mm. And so I had a little bit of that bug in me, like, you know, maybe UX UI is the right thing to do. Maybe that's a little bit better of a, a place to be. Um, I mean, definitely financially, you can mm-hmm. make a lot more money doing UX UI. And so I was like dabbling in that. And I don't know if I have a good answer for that. I think at the end of the day, I felt like my passion wasn't in UX UI, but I gave it a good shot. Like I really did try and like, I actually built an iPhone game about this little little hiker guy running up a mountain and, <laughs> and, he, and then the bear would come and you jump over the bear. But that's another story for another day. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think that's interesting. I think... Uh, if you build two portfolios, it's pretty easy to do on like a Squarespace where you just make projects and then you can separate projects into like an industrial design web page and have it kind of separate from your UX yeah. web page. Well, in the case of noface.nobody, uh, we checked out his Instagram. Um, so it was actually kind of cool. Yeah, it was very cool. And I think that that could be all that you need to show in terms of these sort of like side interests. Because it does... Oh, yeah. Like, just say, hey, check out my Instagram. Yeah. Hmm. It adds a layer to your personality. For sure. And I... But I don't know that you should necessarily put in projects and weave them into your portfolio. Um, But you can use that skill set to amplify your industrial design projects. Right. I agree. Great question, Jose. Thanks for sending that in. Yeah. Um, Our next question comes from Van Heyer. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing name correctly. Uh, it was great meeting you guys at Square One Con this year. Um, it was great to meet you too. I am curious what stands out the most on a page of sketches within a portfolio. Is it the contrast, the line weight, the line quality, or something else entirely? I don't think that a uh, the quality of a sketch page can be can ever be down to the line weight, the line quality. Uh, I don't know. I think I think this is kind of a very targeted question. It's very um, right. down in the minor details, shall we say? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> can we, I just want that sound bite on like some sort of button so I can press it all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, uh, I will say I am a big fan of doing taking or, or scanning your sketches digital whatever it is making sure that the white part of your sketch the page the white of the sketch is actually pic- pixel white mm. i hate when i see sketches and someone didn't put them into photoshop so it's like you know technically it's like a gray page with gray pen lines and it the contrast is so low and it just looks so bad mm. it, this is more of an instagram thing people will post their sketches on instagram and it'll be very um, v- very hard to see because the contrast is so low. Hmm. But I always turn the contrast up as high as I can so that <laughs> my my pen sketch is black. I just, I I... just imagine you putting on sunglasses <laughs> and just like cranking the contrast. It's like that old. I don't remember the speaker company, but it's like Dolby or somebody, and the and the ad is the guy sitting in like the Le Cor- Corbusier chair, and like there's just like the wind hitting him, and his ties flying back. The contrast is just hitting. Yeah, him. yeah. Um, but yeah, but you got yeah. sunburn that way, Nick. I I don't think when when people look at your when be, I get sunburned just walking outside. For five minutes. <laughs> I feel like you get sunburned if sun hits. A mirror that's yeah, yeah, reflecting yeah. into your face. <laughs> yeah, my Ben mirrors. Oh, um, I I will say that when you're fl- like an employer's flipping through their portfolio, they'll look at your sketches as more of a competency task. It's like, mm. oh, can you sketch and convey your ideas? Right. Yes. Check. Good. And then, I mean, me personally, I'm always like, are they actually coming up with cool products and great ideas? Yeah, I mean, at the core of your portfolio, at the core of your design, you should always have the soul of the product. You should always have that great idea or concept. Yeah, there is something really fun about a spread or a scroll of a ton of thumbnail. Like I love that sketches, like the small little doodles. Oh, it's it's really nice. Mm-hmm. But I think that sketches, like every other part of your portfolio, need to tell a story. So obviously 
there needs to be a conclusion to this to the sketches. Yeah. And whether it's three options that you then explored through physical model making or it's one option that you, that everything culminated to, it it needs to be clearly communicated visually. Yes. Where you where you arrive again through the sketching exploration. Right. And again going back to our previous conversation like telling that story in a very visual and visually impactful way. So maybe it's your sketches start out, let's say you're scrolling through a Behance, right? So if you're scrolling, the sketch page or the sketch image should be vertical, right? Mm-hmm. You're scrolling through it. And maybe at, at the top of the image, you have very small thumbnails. And as you get down to the bottom, you have one, the sketches get bigger and bigger until you have the one big sketch. Right. Or I've seen on PDF portfolios or printed portfolios, people will have like all the sketches laid out and they'll take like, you know, like a circle that has a color in it and kind of highlight different features that they liked. And then the right. next page will have all those features implemented into one bigger sketch. There's different, definitely different ways to do it, but yeah. Yeah. Again, it's it's kind of that go and look at portfolios and, and portfolios that you admire, like on Behance or wherever. And just copy it. And yeah, well, no, I mean, that's not a terrible idea that's what i did yeah Mm -hmm. i mean copy it or just like think about understand like why you like it like what is it about it that you like it yeah the thing is is that copying copying something copying something graphic in terms of layout first of all it'll never come out like come out exactly the same way yeah you have a different you have a different project yeah you have a different project you have different content don't worry about it steal steal the idea yep absolutely Mm mm-hmm Good artist borrow, great artist steal. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite quotes. Um, but yeah. Yeah, that was that was a good question. Thanks for sending it in, Ban. Uh, I guess we have we have time for one, one last question? I think we have time for one more. Okay. Uh, Josh Le- Lyman at Busta Limes says... Ooh, what a good handle. <laughs> Come on, give it up. <laughs> says, I've talked to some people who have been in the industry for years, and they say over time you often outgrow this constant itch to keep pushing out designs. What are your thoughts on this craving for a creative outlet? It's even in it's even more in demand with the popularity of Instagram slash Behance, but is it in, inherent in someone creative or is it more of a phase that gets tiring and less enjoyable as you grow? Essentially, Josh is like, now that you guys are older, and not students anymore. Are you still like passionate about design and creating these side projects and stuff? Um, this is a really interesting question because I was thinking about this recently. Somebody that we're that we've been interested in bringing on the podcast is actually one of my first managers um, at Quirky, Julia Troy. Um, you may have seen she did a, a Skillshare through Quirky on on Skillshare about sketching. She is. A, an amazing designer. Wait, did Reed just post this recently? Reed just posted this okay. recently. Okay. Um, amazing designer. One of one of the best sketchers that I've ever seen. You know, um, and uh, I remember her saying to me at the end of a work day, she was like, or or maybe it was at the beginning of a work day. She was like, "Don't you like?" Isn't it like when you go home, don't you just like continue to think about design and mull over design? Yeah. And, uh, and you know, like me as a young impressionable designer, I was like, yeah, I, I do. My next job, I had a different manager and this same manager, I said that exact same thing to, And she said, when I go home, I don't think about design. And I don't know that there's necessarily a right or wrong to this, but it is something that's kind of um, either like those two things either encouraged or discouraged a certain type of mindset. It's that's and, yeah, that's interesting, James. And uh, I think that for some people, like there is an obsessive nature to design and but it's very rewarding. And for other people... Design is something that they do for work, and maybe they need to recharge. Mm-hmm. Maybe they need the time after work to, yeah, to just, like, explore different things or be interested in different things, and that's okay, too. 
like i yeah i i've definitely met both side both types of people like there are designers out there believe it or not who who go to work and design as their job and then they come home and they don't want to design anymore right me personally i i, I think that's kind of crazy because i am the exact opposite like <laughs> i my, my switch is broken like you know like you know like in those movies where the train like the cartoon like yeah. the train they like push it full force and the handle breaks off and they can't stop the train <laughs> that's me that's me with design right maybe i'll get to that point though one day where i am like burnt out and i don't want to design more i mean i don't know i don't know what the future holds i mean i've been going strong for for what three years now yeah i i will say i do ebb and flow certainly i think everyone has their dips their ups where they're feeling like i'm rocking it and then maybe there's those downs where you're like i i i'm just not feeling this design i really don't really want want to design right now and i think that's okay right i will say that for myself i i enjoy pursuing design outside of work but it's like it's a muscle that I have to exercise because I can get, I can switch it off. And when I switch it off, it's very hard to switch it back on like, no. <laughs> to get back to the, like the side project grind. Mm. It's, um, you know, it's just like anything, like if you're not doing it consistently and I was talking to you about Mr. Doodle recently, Oh yeah, a- an Instagram handle, this guy, is just obsessively doodling. He's always doodling. He, he's really pretty well known. He's done a ton of doodles for all the Silicon Valley startups. I know he yeah. like goes to Google and just doodles on a wall. Yeah, he's he's very prolific. And and what I said to you was, I think that if he stops drawing, he might die. <laughs> but I think that there is something to the momentum. Like I feel like I have a sense, I have somewhat of a sense of, where you are and i feel like there's a momentum Mm. there's a momentum that's been built up and like essentially you're just riding this snowball that keeps keeps growing i 100 percent agree and that is my exact feeling of especially the instagram community when i you know when i started the instagram and i started growing that following it turned into that snowball. Like that's the way I explained it. it was yeah. like, you know, it was like something fun at first, and I mean, it still is fun. I just, <laughs> it was something fun. And now oh I'm no, scared. Freudian slip. No, no. Uh, it it was, you know, just this personal project at first, and then it grew into everyone being involved, and then it was like a much bigger of a responsibility. Like, how can I top this? Yeah. And I'm always trying to like up my game, which is great. I mean, it's good motivation. Yeah. No, I mean, Nick, you're a very impressive person. I'm not going to sit here and say <laughs> well, otherwise. James, you are a great too. Shh. Don't even. But what what I'm saying here is like, I think that like if this, it sounds like this person is almost concerned about the waning uh, like creative drive. Yes. Yeah. And what I am saying is, is that for some people, it's an inherent drive. And for others, it's a daily exercise routine and it's not wrong either way right because like like well and then there's a there's a third thing there's well there's three things but there's also the people who leave design at the door like but i but this person seems to be like kind of concerned and so what i'm saying is that for myself i don't necessarily i have somewhat of an inherent inherent drive but I also need to exercise that in order to keep it going. Like, I, like it I, is. it is an exercise. Yeah. I mean, I do too. Like, you know, when I was posting on Instagram every day, I haven't, I don't do that much anymore, but it is this thing that's like almost, it almost akin to running every day. It's like, yeah. Oh, I got to wake up early. I got to put my shoes on. Like I got to run. I actually get to put in that effort, you know, posting yeah. and creating that, momentum is effort right and uh you know they say that for for people who are trying to get into an exercise routine you should wear exercise clothes to bed that's a good idea if you want to get into a designing routine sleep with your pen and notebook. sleep with your pen and notebook <laughs> yeah well i mean that is people sometimes you know they have a notebook at their bedside table you know to draw things down yeah. or whatever write things down 
um, it's it, it's an exercise, and sure. uh, it's like a muscle, and you have to exercise it for sure. Um, that was a so, great yeah. great question, Josh. Thanks for sending in. Yeah. Uh, the shout out of the week. We do one of these every week and I am shouting out this particular person because not only are they super talented, but I want them to continue posting because they've just kind of gotten that momentum recently. Mm. Dino underscore design underscore sketches. Right. And, and Dino is like spelled like Dino. Yeah. D-I-N-O. Yeah. And uh, Dino went to school with me. Okay. He was the okay. year above me. James, how much you get paid for these shout outs? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Ten, ten, uh, well, I'm not going to say how much, but I just did. Um, Dino was the, he was one of a number of people that there's, there's always sort of those upperclassmen that you look at and mm-hmm. you go, that's where I want to be. I remember those guys, yeah. And uh, Dino was, he like, he was incredible, like one of the most talented designers that I've ever come across. Yeah, you you showed me his Instagram today, and I looked at his sketches, and man, they're they're beautiful. He's it's some yeah. some on point stuff right there. And um, I'm really happy that he started because for a long time he didn't have a, a a design outlet on Instagram. He just had a personal uh, page, which was locked. You know, a private page. Yeah, yeah, private page. And now he started this design page and, um, you know, it's just the caliber of work that I expect from him. And I am, am shouting him out so that hopefully he will continue to post. All right, Dino, I'm following. You better, uh, you better, you better, <laughs> better make some cool stuff. Um, he will, but, undoubtedly. But yeah, uh, thank, thank you everyone to, for listening and sending in questions. If you have more questions, of course, podcast at gmail.com. Check out all the, the images on, in the links on minordetailspodcast.com. Mm-hmm. And our intro and outro is by Kiyoshi the Kid. Oh. Of course, we got to shout him out. Um, we got YouTube. We got videos. that YouTube. You definitely should watch this one on YouTube because I showed off my portfolio right quick. Yeah. That little snippet right there. And uh, rate, like, subscribe. Yeah. All those things. Uh, and and I would really encourage people that when you contact us, even if you just have suggestions for what you'd like to see on the podcast, not just questions, yeah. please email us. Of course. MinorDetailsPodcast at gmail.com. Yeah. If you have topics, anything. If you just want to say, hey, that's fine too. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Oh, what's your handle? Oh, man? yeah, yeah. I, Gosh, I met, darn it! It's been two weeks. I forgot how to do the podcast. Yet. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I'm at Nick P. Baker, and I'm at I Draw and Receipts. All right, see you guys later. <laughs>